Hey, we thank you for listening to the very best in modern praise and worship. My name is Tony Hammock. I'm here in the studio with Charlie Fuquay, the king of controversy, and Pastor Joel Krogan. Uh, Pastor Joel has just shared a great message with his folks over at Hope Lutheran Church about how the church should respond to Islam. And ironically enough, Charlie and I were just discussing this subject um, last week on the radio. And uh, we wanted to bring Pastor Joel in on the discussion because he's done some research and looked at some things. And uh, I'm sure in light of history and the Bible, comparing the Quran, he's got some insight. And so, Joel, we welcome you to the broadcast. It's good having you. Good to be here. And uh, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and get started. Um, let's talk, uh, you want to talk a little bit about the news, what's been going on in the news uh, lately? I, I think we ought Hamas. to jump right, oh, into Hamas. Yeah, well, yeah. obviously Hamas is, is sending multiple missiles into Israel. And Israel, in an attempt to defend itself, has had to invade the Gaza Strip. Yeah. And so there's a lot of controversy whether Israel should do what it's doing or not. But, uh, you know, history has shown that Islam and, and Hamas, our, the people in Hamas are Muslims, has always been aggressive in invading and militarily attacking and conquering other people. Right. And it's, I believe it's one of the most important issues we face today is what should the Christian response, or, or that of a Christian nation, if you can even call the United States a Christian nation anymore, right. what should our response to Islam be? Now, you know, the response of Islam toward any other religion is clear. It's taught in the Quran that Islam should kill all followers of all other religions, and that's what they've been doing since the time of Muhammad. So they have no confusion as to how they should respond to other religions. Now, as Christians, I don't think we're under the same guidelines, and obviously we have limits on us that they are not under, and I think that's what we need to discuss. And with those guidelines and, and limits that God puts on us, what should our response be? And you know, one of the reasons I wanted to discuss this is I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. Well, it's obviously a tough question, and um, you know, I, I think I made the point last week that individuals and nations, in some regards, have different uh, rules in, in the areas of war. Um, but how do you draw those lines, and how do you, you know, those are what do you call those ethics questions? You know, where there's a bit of a you know, you've got these moral dilemmas you've got to solve. Um, you know, we've got some men in our church that have fought in wars, and they've they've killed enemy soldiers. You know, in war, and uh, you know that's. I know the scripture says, "Thou shalt not murder." You know, the, the commandment is not to murder and uh, to kill in war. At war times, is in my understanding a different. Uh, it's a different thing than murdering. You know, where you're just some kind of psychopath and you go off the beam and you kill somebody because they did something to you or whatever but you know it's definitely a uh, an issue and it, it would seem like there's a certain amount of uh, historical precedent for the Islam running over politically correct cultures you know they come in uh, they have a minority they win hearts and minds uh, then they when they get that majority they just go military on you and they conquer you and they'll kill you so, with that being in mind, you know, and the, and the doctrine of sacred deception and all these different ideas that are, you know, in Islam, we we should be very cautious. I mean, we've got to watch this. I, I was watching the, uh, I don't know if he's the political spokesman or the military spokesman for the Israeli uh, Air Force, Air Defense, or Army, or whatever. But he said, hey, we've been here for 2,000 years, 3,000 years before Muslims even got here. And we'll be here after Hamas is gone. Yeah. And uh, this is our land. You know, and we will fight. You know, he was very, uh, he was very non-politically uh, correct in the, the language yeah. he chose. Of course, you know, Islam teaches that once Muslims conquer a land, that that's Muslim land forever. Right. But just because they teach that doesn't mean that's so. That, yeah, well, but I mean, that's what they believe. That's what right. they follow. Joel, 
in, in your message Sunday, you, you made um, a mention of what your human response was inclined to be, and then you talked about what you thought God's response should be. <laughs> you, would you like to elaborate that on? No, but I will. <laughs> okay. Okay. I may get myself in trouble with this, but wouldn't be the first time. Um, I think uh, when we look at this kind of situation and we look at, at the evil that's perpetrated by Islam over so many countries and so many people and the misery that it spreads, the first, uh, the first inclination of the human nature is to go take care of it and be done with it and make them disappear. I think in the sermon uh, Sunday I said, uh, send over a few atomic bombs and just make the whole place a sheet of glass. I have heard people say that. I've read that. I heard it yesterday. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I did. Um, and that's that's a human response because it's something we can see happening. We can see the problem being solved, uh, and yet now the flip side of that is, and, and in the sermon I, I made a point: we could do that, but what about the Christians who are living there? What are we going to do about that? Um, and, and that's where you know people of faith come into the picture with. We think differently than let's just go kill them all and take care of everything. We have to take into consideration what about the Christians who live there? What about the Muslims who, who now are unbelievers but may become believers later? Uh, that's what makes this whole issue so complicated uh, because we, you know, we bring God into the picture whereas you know, a lot of the, the secularists do not. They don't have to worry about things like that. Your sermon was based on the text of the, the wheat and the tares. Yeah, Matthew 13. And, and would you like to elaborate on that some? Well, Matthew 13, in this one, Jesus is painted as the sower of seed who, who planted a field out in the world. And then the devil is the sower of bad seed who came in and planted bad seed in the crop. Now, now would, would you agree that... Islam is bad seed. Islam is bad seed. Okay. The, this is the devil's work in the world we see very plainly. Uh, Martin Luther said the same thing uh, about that. He witnessed all of this too, just like we are today. He's familiar with it too. Uh, and so we see in, in Matthew 13 that, that reading says, uh, when, the farm, when the good seed sower, his workers saw that the weeds were there, he, they asked him, should we go pull them up? And the the sower said, no, let them both grow. And then in the end, when we harvest, we're going to take care of this problem. Okay, and of course, if we apply that to, to Islam and Christianity, we see we are to live. How can I put this? We're living together. We're coexisting, not like the bumper sticker. Yeah. Um, but we do coexist. And yeah, we have to take action sometimes. But... In the end, God is the one who's going to take care of everything. And, and again, coming from that.